Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming out tonight to join us to have another evening around God's Word. As it is uh, primarily a uh, audience who know uh, how these things work, um, it does mean that uh, our evening can be a little bit more interactive, which is a good thing. So um, we'll look forward to a um, uh, good night around the subject of what happens when you die. So if you'd like to stand, we'll open our night with prayer. Our loving and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for this quiet time that we have now to come here tonight to freely read from thy word and to think about it and to study it and to talk about it together. We know, Father, that thy word is the only true source of hope and salvation. And we know that you have extended a great promise in thy word. And as we think about these things and hear about these things tonight, we pray that you'll watch over us all and help us uh, both here in the hall and those watching online to be built up in the things that we believe. So we pray for thy guidance in all things we do tonight. It's in Jesus Christ's name we ask this. Amen. So obviously it is a uh, holiday weekend, uh, and so perhaps that um, has some influence on uh, the um, numbers who are here tonight. I see there's quite a few um, junior burgers with us, which is great. So the first part of our night, um, Ernie will be speaking to us on the subject, and the second part of the evening will be more interactive. We will be uh, filling in some areas of the whiteboard there. So for those who are under the age of 15, I won't ask you now, I will ask you now, but I don't want you to answer now. If you had to um, divide off any subject, any subject at all, into five sections like I have there, maybe you can have a think about how they should be divided up, but um, I'll get you to th have a think about that through the um, uh, Uncle talk, and then we can get into that. So we don't have a reading this evening, so we'll now ask you to come forward and speak to us. Thanks. Right, good evening, my dear friends. Good to have you all with us this evening. So the question that we're looking at is what happens when you die? Um, most people, religious or not, accept that if you give enough time, we will all die. So that's the normal expectation of most people. So when we were thinking of putting tonight together and who would do what and so on, and then Phil said, oh, I'll do a discussion, you do the talk. So um, I thought, yep, I'll put together some headings so he can work out what he wants to do for his discussion. So fairly early in the piece, so define life and death and then we'll look at the fact that from life, God made Adam and Eve and gave them a commandment. Adam and Eve sinned and the punishment was death. So there's our life and death part coming out there. Um, the cause of our dying, what is death in Bible terms, and then next week, hopefully, God willing, uh, we will look at our uh, hope, or as I've got here in my notes, is death all we can look forward to? And of course, um, people without God, that's all they've got, is what we've got now, life, and then after that, nothing. So let's define our terms. So what is life? Looked up two or three things to find out what other people thought, and I've got here the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death. Another definition, the state characterised by the ability to get and use energy so that we eat food to get energy and then we use it by doing something to reproduce, to grow, and to respond to change. Um, 
It's a quality that plants and animals lose when they die. And then another one gave seven characteristics of life. Nutrition, respiration, excretion, growth, movement, sensitivity and reproduction. They all aim the survival of the organism and or the species. This one was quite interesting. Looked up Wikipedia and after a couple of similar definitions to that, there is currently no consensus regarding the definition of life. So I thought that was interesting. So that there's all these, what they would call part definitions, but exactly what is life? No, there's no full one. So then we look at death. Death is the permanent termination of all biological processes which sustain an organism and as such, it's the end of life. So, quite interesting there. Death is the end of life. Um, and then you look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, after a few other definitions, there is currently no consensus regarding the definition of, of uh, life. Uh, sorry, of death or life in the Britannica one. So, where do we go? Well, if we're going to look at death, we've got to look at the creation of life. And so we'll go to Genesis chapter 1, right at the beginning of our Bibles. Make sure we can see what we're reading. So Genesis 1 and verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So God created man in his own image. So the creation of Adam was by God. And the interesting de thing there is he was made in the image and likeness of God. As he says in verse 26, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth. And so God makes a man. Now, for the full process of how God made that man in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 we read the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul now that word at the end or the two words at the end living soul in Hebrew is the word nephesh and it's actually quite interesting um, in chapter 1, verse 24, it says, uh, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. That's the same word. So it literally means any living animal. It's not just a human, any living animal. So he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living creature. So just... Reviewing just reviewing what we've got there, man was shaped by the dust, by the angels, man was shaped in dust. And then God breathed the breath of life. So we could say the breath of life was the power of God, which is commonly called the spirit of God. So God's energy, the spirit by which he has made all things, was put into man. And as, as the angel breathed into his nostrils that breath of life, whoops, 
Man became a living creature. So I know our subject is what happens when you die, but we've got to look, work out what a living, breathing human creature is. And here's the first man made, our forefather, as the scriptures point out. Now, continuing from there, as we were told in Genesis chapter 1, God said, male and female made he them, in verse 27. And so, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. So God looks at the man he's made, realises the man needs extra help to live, a companion, and he makes a companion for the man. In 2 verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And so God puts Adam into a deep sleep, it said. Today, if we were going to do an operation, people give us an anaesthetic. It's the same basic idea. And then when he's in that state, God removes a bone from his side and then closes up the wound. So verse 21 the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the woman, uh, unto the man. And so Eve, Eve is made uh, fr from Adam from the bone and the flesh that's removed from Adam, that's what Eve is made from. And then she's brought and, and presented to the man. And of course in verse 23, he looks and he says, she's bone of my bones and flesh is my flesh, uh, and so on. And uh, verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And so she's presented to Adam he accepts that she is made from him and what takes place then is the first marriage, a unity. Now, just before Eve is made, in verse 15 of chapter 2, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so here's our main introduction, I suppose. We've looked at him creating Adam, making him a living creature. But now Adam is given the job of caring for that special garden, the garden that was in Eden, And then he is told, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because if you do, you will die. Now, in that last phrase of verse 17, it says, thou shalt surely die. And in the margin it says, dying thou shalt die. In my margin, there's a little number alongside it. Dying thou shalt die. And that's a Hebrew expression that does two things. It explains the process, but it gives it special emphasis. So he says, if you eat of that tree, you will become a dying creature and end up dying. And he says it that way to emphasise that he will surely die, as we've got in ours. Not that he will die on that very day, but the process of dying will start then and he will die. 
Uh, I've missed something. Just an interesting thing. We went through some of the definitions of life and death. I want to just add that most scientific and medical publications have a policy that they will not use the term God or promote creation. I'll just read that again because it's quite important. Most science and medical publications have a policy that they will not use the term God or promote creation. And as I found out when I did a talk overseas, quite an important talk at one occasion, the people come up and said, oh, can you re remove any reference to God out of your talk because our publishers won't publish it with God in it? And I couldn't understand what they were talking about. And a brother then who was a librarian, explained to me this policy that scientific publications will not accept things that talk about God. And so when we're looking at what is life and death, the Bible has the answer and the definitions which are right and proper. But of course, because it's from the Bible, they won't accept that. And so you get that terminology where it says uh, there's no proper definition. So, first command, don't eat. So then we go to the first sin and its punishment. And so, in chapter 3, um, we read of a serpent, and it says to the woman... Hath God said you will not eat of the tree of life, of the, of the tree of the garden? And in verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So, as I said, that command was given before she was made. So Adam has transmitted that command faithfully to her. He's told her the command of God. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And so she gives her commentary on that. And so the serpent reasons and says in verse 4, you won't die. Because God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open and you will be as gods, or as the angels, you could say, knowing good and evil. So he's saying, if you're going to have more knowledge and everything and be like the angels, well, the angels can't die, so you won't die. You'll just know good and evil, which is what the tree was called. Now notice the response of Eve. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now, we're not told how long she was in the garden. I like to put an extended period on that. So she'd seen that tree before, but until this animal came along and said, oh, that tree, it's going to make you like gods. So now she's looking at the tree and saying, wow, it looks nice to eat. Oh, it's really nice to look at. It's pleasant to the eyes. And a tree to make me wise. Ah, oh, you'll know everything. You'll know good and evil, the serpent said. So she's listened to what he has said, his temptation, and it's given her that desire for that food. And she looks at it in a completely different manner. And as a result, she took of the fruit and ate, gave to Adam, her husband, with her, and he did eat. And so God says, don't eat of that and now, as a result of just looking at the tree a little bit different, she has given herself desires and she's answered those desires and he's gone with her. And they've eaten of that fruit. So, in verse 17... 
God says to Adam, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles, thorns also and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So there's the punishment. But notice the words... You shall surely die is now of dust you are and unto dust shalt thou return. So that death that was promised to him is the fact that he will return back to that dust that he was made. So the complete cessation of all life. He was made from dust that creature called Adam standing in front of that angel was made of dust and he would end up as dust. Now, just want to look briefly. We've got Adam and Eve here as sinners condemned to having problems with their lives which will eventually end up in them dying. And yet what we saw in chapter 1 is a totally different picture. The purpose for which they were made and when God saw them being made was very good. And they've fallen from that very good state. And God said, let us make man in our own image and our own likeness, as he spoke to the angels, and give them dominion. And now they've fallen from that position. They're no longer in the image and likeness of God. They're not like God anymore. And that position of dominion will have to wait. They have fallen from what they were made. So, we looked at some definitions before, but in Bible terms, life is having the breath of life. That is, the power or spirit of God which makes life possible. So, that is life. That's what we've seen. It's the power or spirit of God working in our bodies which makes life possible. I was speaking to a friend of mine who does autopsies and I, it was an unusual question actually, I said to him one day, I said, because it was to do with evolution, and I said to him, I said, if a body dies from shock, all the parts are there, undamaged. I said, evolution needs millions and millions of years. But I said, what, if, what about if man got there with that body that's just died, complete, whole? Can he, with the energy and the brain that he's got, make that body live again? And he laughed his head off. And I, I said, what, what's so funny? I he said, we had a major seminar through the week. And he said, that question came up and it divided the group into two parts the religious ones and the non-religious ones. He said, because the religious ones said, once that body is dead and all the life forces have gone out, the, the spirit of God is gone, we can't do a thing. And he said the others didn't know what to say because they knew they couldn't make it alive, but they said it happened by an accident millions of years ago. Without a complete body, life came along and eventually became a complete body over millions of years. And so, yeah, the Bible says the breath of life belongs to God. It's the power of God. So, 
So death is the loss of the breath of life. Once that breath of life is gone, the body is dead. Let's have a look at Ecclesiastes 9. Just past the middle of the Bible. Ecclesiastes 9. Verses 4 to 6. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. A living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die. So we as living creatures, we have awareness. We have an awareness that we're alive and we know that we can die. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. They have no memory. When they die, the everything, their knowledge, their memory also has gone with them. Verse 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. So... We're quite plainly told there that dead people don't know anything. Whatever life is has been removed and they don't know. As it said to Adam, of dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. So Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth. And he's talking of death and he's got a bit of a picture of death um, in verse 6, quite an unusual one. Um, he says, but at that point, the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit or the breath of life, uh, it, the word there means breath, shall return unto God who gave it. So that is it. Dust goes back, the spirit of life returns to God. So the question is, why do we die? So let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. So, wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. And we looked at that. Adam and Eve sinned and as a result, death came into the world. And so death has passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And so because we have that same temptations as what Eve succumbed to and Adam back in those days. We also sin, and he goes on to talk about forgiveness, but we also sin and therefore we also die. So it doesn't, you know, at that point things don't look very good, but we want to look at things next week so can we just turn to as an introduction to next week just turn the page Romans 6 verse 23 the wages of sin is death which is what we looked at but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so that's the introduction to what we'll be looking there is a promise of hope so death in itself, and if it was left to us, death is the end. But God has said, no, I will give more hope. So now hand over to Phil. Alrighty, well thanks for that. And uh, 
now we'll see how closely everybody's been listening to um, uh, work through a um, few points there on the whiteboard. I believe if I turn this on here, once I'm one array from the microphone, you should be able to hear me still. So, um, yes, that sounds good. So, what, when I, we asked for what are the, uh, in fact, can someone actually open the um, glass doors here? Because I'm expecting lots of answers from the, from the back of the hall. Um, Steve Dowling, luckily, he's almost jumping out of the seat to answer, and I would hate to deny him that opportunity. Thank you. So, um, when we said before, what are the five sections about what you would ask of any subject? What would they be? Those who may be still at school might be. Now, oh, by the way, I need to put the incentives. I appreciate it's a, um, uh, been a while since um, people haven't had, you know, had masks on for a long time, so people have got used to just sitting there in the audience not being able to say anything. Well, most people have got their masks off now, so um, that means they are also able to have some incentive. So with there being a lot of kids here, I'm happy to pass out some incentive to correct answers or even partly correct answers. So w what are the five ways that you should approach any subject? Samuel looks like he's got an answer. Oh, does he get five lollies for that? Uh, I, I don't think so, just, just one. But um, Yes, so let's uh, put that up there. So we've got where. When. Who. Oh, I want to do it that way. And probably most importantly, why. Now, I'm not going to get into the practice of throwing lollies across the, uh, the hall on a, on a Sunday night, but uh, so I, I can wonder. Uh, so um, let's start off by dealing with uh, the, the where, I think, is probably the easiest question to answer. So yes, I thought I would see a whole lot of hands go up once, once I knew there was incentives. So, so when we talk about where it happens, there's obviously a, a, an obvious answer. So, so what happened? Where, where, when we're dealing with the subject of where, when it comes to dying, issue? Um, wouldn't it be, it could be anywhere because you could die anywhere. Okay, so you're talking about the, actually the death itself. Well, that's, that's, that, that's what I mean about the subject. It actually is, uh, so yes, death can happen to anybody at any place. So that's correct. But what we're probably more interested in tonight James, is where, um, which is, oh okay, so that's more the, the what, comes into the what section of, the, of it, so, but when we talk about where, anyone who's, who we know who has died, where are they now? Excuse me. I think we might have to uh, <laughs> brush up on that when we get home. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. I, I <laughs> We're all here to learn, I guess. So, uh, I, I'm sure. I'm sure he was. Yes. Uh, so, um, any, anyone else would like to um, share something a little more correct? <laughs> Probably won't actually. But so, so the, the where is it, it can happen. Uh, anywhere, but what's more important is what happens to people when they die. So we not come as you knocked out the uh, the incorrect answer of it's not heaven. That's good. All right. So it is the grave. The grave. Yes, or the ground. Well done. Uh, I think it was Abigail. Uh, Alrighty. And any other factors about the? I am going to start have to start, start lobbing these. I'm sorry because other people are going to be uh, walking around. That was for Abigail. Was it you who answered that? Yes. <laughs> I, again, the the idea is that you're supposed to be so busy chewing that you don't actually you can't actually answer another question. And then we sh uh, share it around evenly, you see. Uh, but um, so uh, the ground. And so any other, s that's probably covering off the main areas of where. And that, oh, that was the easy one. So, and I do want to hear some uh, references to this answer. So, th so the when. 
Uh, I hope, hope you know the answer, boys. I'm happy to take... Yes, so when... Okay, well that's kind of covering what we did. Was the Not necessarily. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for, for someone to actually summarise what Uncle Ern said. He said that when it's something happens, so God breathes in the breath of life into us. When you stop breathing. When you stop breathing. Okay, alrighty. Yes, they certainly do. So it's interesting, that um, Hebrew word, which was referred to before of nephesh, while it mainly means breathing in, it actually actually uh, can be used in the terms of uh, air being vacuumed out. There's two, reference, two occurrences of in the Bible, one which means uh, snuffed out and another one I think is taken away. So while we mainly know it from the first few chapters of Genesis, it actually can also be used where God's actually taking that breath away. So, um, so that's when death actually happens, but who knows, Stu, I'll get you a point, hope you this out. Who knows when, when the process starts? Anyone? What? When you're born. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think that's what I know we said at the front. But um, so when starts when we're born? Alrighty. And as far as. Um, the who goes? All. all? Absolutely all? No, no, nobody? <laughs> sure, yes, that's right. So, and that is correct, all right? Has, has everybody who's lived on this earth died? Every living creature. Yes, yes, well, that's, that's also true, Roger, yep. Everyone loves Starburst, obviously, because everyone's getting involved. It's fantastic. Um, so, all living creatures. They said there's only two sure things, death and taxes. That's true. So, as an extension of that, humans, animals, plants, Yes, okay, bugs as well, yes. I think you get the idea. Alrighty. So, because that was a little bit of a trick question because some people say, hey, on a minute, um, Jesus didn't corrupt. And that's true, but he did die. All right, so that means that every, every creature that has been on uh, this earth is either has died or is in a dying state. So... Let's uh, see if we can get a quote or two. I am a bit behind on these, but uh, I'm sure people won't really mind missing out if they had to. But let's, um, what was the quote that we looked at before about from Ecclesiastes? There's actually three quotes from Ecclesiastes uh, which talk about this. So anyone like to, did anyone note down what they were? Girls in the front row there? I, I saw two of you writing notes, so I assume that Ecclesiastes. Yes. Daniel's on fire, he definitely needs. Very good, yes. And then there's another one as well. So what do we have? We had Ezekiel, uh, sorry, Ecclesiastes. 12 verse 7. And then 9 verse, what was it again, Grace? Uh, and then and verse 10 as well, yep. And I do believe there's another one. Well, there's, Ecclesiastes is mainly all about living and dying, what you do with your life, of course. But, oh, while I'm down there. Um, so, any others from Ecclesiastes? Yeah, Roger. 
Correct questions. Yes. Alrighty, so I had Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So maybe we didn't uh, turn that up before, so maybe we could have a look at that now. And again, it's just reiterating what we um, talked about before. Of course, that's the chapter which talks about being a time to be born and a time to die. But if I could draw your attention particularly to verses 18 to 20. It says there, I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beasts for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Alrighty. So what's another book of the Bible which talks about people's mortality? Okay. Just remind me what that exact quote says. Yep, so Romans 5 verse 12. Very good. So, uh, the, the, the book I was referring to is in the Old Testament. Asher, I know you're very good at answering questions in Sunday school. R Romans is in the New Testament, yep. But what about, what about a book in the Old Testament? Which talks a lot about people who, who die and what, what happens to people when they sin and... No, uh, it's the name of a character. It's it's three letters long. Job. Job. Well done, Stewie. Oh, I, I have one already, but uh, you might get a bonus if you continue answering questions. So there's uh, lots of um, references in Job to death. Let's just turn one of those up. That's from Job chapter 34. So Job is on the other side of Psalms. So Job is a discussion that he has with his three friends all about how if we do wrong, what happens to us and what God uh, does to us. And uh, at the very, towards the end of it there, chapter 34, verses, verse 15, I particularly wanted to highlight. All flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Alrighty, so that's the important thing that it's one thing to die, but what happens to you? You don't go off to heaven, you, um, put that up there, Job 34 verse 15, wasn't it? Alrighty, so, do want to make sure we cover that who off uh, quite extensively, because that's obviously quite an important and integral part of the subject. Alrighty, but I think that probably summarises it pretty well. So if we move on to the how, how, how does it happen? No, not because, no, I'm looking for the because, because that would be more the why. I think you have had your chance to answer plenty. All right, so does anyone know how it happens? We did cover that. Before, just very briefly. Yes, have we got? Uh, sorry, um, Esther. Oh, that's so quiet. My hearing's not as good as it used to be. Yes, yeah, stop breathing. Yes, that's very good. Alrighty. So you yeah, stop breathing. That's one step in it. Does anyone, by the way, know a quote that talks about how that people stop breathing when they die? There's not many around, but there are a few. Oh, wow. I'll have him, what he's having. Psalm 104. And what verses were there, Roger? Psalm 104, verse 29. 
Yes, very good. Alrighty. So let's put that up there. Alrighty, so yes, we do stop breathing, and that's one thing, but what then what happens after that? Yep. So would you say that our um, body stops functioning? Very good. And then, there really is only one more step. Yes, Asha? Return you return to the dust. That's very good. Now, your dad slept through most of the first half of the session, so he probably doesn't know the answer to this, but does he know, know a verse which actually has anything to do with this? <laughs> well, we've got lots, haven't we, because we covered that up, up here in Ecclesiastes, so we won't embarrass him by... Uh, Sorry, I, I didn't hear that, brother. I'm, I'm sure it was wrong anyway. So, uh, uh, so yeah, we, we are crossing over a few of the same um, same quotes because they they do talk about that sort of thing. So, um, oh. so one of those. And Asha, you ready? You, you run up here and, and grab. Yep. Good boy. So, if we then move on to the most important, in my opinion, which is why. All right, and the thing is that we can talk about this as a theoretical subject and everyone says, all right, fine, we've talked about this tonight um, and we do all agree now that we do die and let's go off home and have a great night because we've uh, all considered the fact that we're uh, you know, starting to die already and on our way to the grave. Well, that's a fairly uh, negative evening to have, but as we've uh, heard before, this is one of a two-part series where next week we'll be... Um, covering something which is a lot more positive, and that is, well, what happens once we die, and why is it that people actually live a, a life serving God if they're just going to end up dying anyway? But why, why do we sin? Anyone who has an answer question so far? Well, either. So uh, you, you, we can start by answering that question is because we... Because we, because we sin, that's right. Now we do have a bit of time, so we can uh, then stare off there and say, so why do we sin? Again, we've, just for people who haven't answered a question, just to make it fair for everybody. Oh, that's right, Abigail, you hadn't answered a question. So what was... Very good. Um, alrighty, and um, this shouldn't be too hard, but the, who has a, um, a quote that we can put next to that fact? James 1, verse 13 to 15. And what about one that was referred to in the first part of our evening? Yeah. Hugh, again, give everyone else a chance. So in the first three chapters of the Bible, there's a number of quotes there which talks about it. Anyone? All right, well, let's turn it up because uh, we probably should know this. I think everyone probably does know the answer. They're just a, a bit shy. So Genesis chapter 3. And while it doesn't directly say that we're tempted, it's an example of somebody being tempted Alrighty, so in those 
uh, first half of that chapter there, and then the second half of the chapter is talking about the repercussions of that temptation. So I'll just put on there Genesis 3. Alrighty, so... Certainly. I didn't think of it from this point of view. I didn't know all of Phil's questions, but why do we sin? And the boy brought up, yes, we're tempted. But just something I want you to think about, because we don't often realise that we're tempted until we actually do the wrong thing. And so in a normal, everyday life, we've got desires to do a range of things, many of which are not sin. So a simple thing, and I suppose the young people can understand this as well as the older. On a boiling hot day, you go for a bit of a hike and you see a shot and you think, ah, will they have a cool drink? No problem. You go outside tonight and that's probably one of the last things you'll think about because it's not hot and you're not thirsty and it's cold. And the same thing, you drive along with your kids in the car on a hot day and you stop for petrol. Can we have an ice cream? Can we have an ice cream? There's not too many kids on days like today asking for ice cream. And so there are natural desires in our body that are prompted by things which we see and, and, and the desire for those things will change day after day depending on our circumstances. And so some of those desires, which will lead to sin, we can say to ourselves today, we're never going to do that. And then a different set of circumstances will come up and you've done something that you were never, ever going to do. And you recognise what could have caused the temptation days before, but the change of circumstances are such that that went through and automatically just registered and you went along with it. Okay, thank you. So um, let's just uh, explore the other main area of, of the why. And that is, so Naomi was right, because we sin, and then we went off on uh, that tangent then, but what, what, what's the other reason why we die, which is because we sin? So what are we made of? Okay, very good, yes. So, um, just put that down, down there. Uh, we inherited, what, what sort of nature would you say, a, a fleshly nature? That's probably not quite the right word, but a, a, mortal, a mortal nature, nature. yes. Okay. That's right, we're made of dust, that's right. Yep, put that. Alrighty. So, um, and that's, that's the whole point of why we co cover the subject, because the thing is that if we just, everyone just died, and as a lot of people in society today believe, that's all that happens to you, and your 70 years or whatever you amount time you have on Earth is that's it, and it doesn't matter what happens in that time, you just then die, and that's the end of you. Well, then that's not much of a uh, hope, is it? So, by understanding this half of it here, and then also the second half of what we hope to cover next week, we can see that the two things are very um, closely linked, and so that's the reason why we can still have a hope that yes, everybody who we know and have known will eventually die, but there is a hope beyond that. So hopefully that's been helpful to um, work through those things there. We do hope that you can all join us again next week when we can look at the hope beyond the grave because that is obviously a lot more of a positive subject, but um, hopefully you can join us at that point. So. 
we will close up now and uh, give the thanks for supper. If you'd like to stand, and Ernie will come and do that for us. Thanks. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and thine omnipotent name. We pray, Heavenly Father, that thy kingdom might come, that thy will might be done upon this earth. For as we have learnt, Heavenly Father, our first parents sinned and brought death upon this earth. And that nature, that mortal nature which they were given, has passed on to all of us as their children. And we, Heavenly Father, continue in that way of mortality and sin. And so we pray that thou might watch over us, guide us and keep us. And if thy son has not returned, we pray that we might learn again next week that there is a hope of life after death. That as thou hast raised up thy son from the grave, so that hope shall also come to us. And we pray also and thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessings which thou dost shower upon us day by day. And especially at this time for the supper, we pray that we might use that strength in thy service to give praise and honour unto thy name. For we thank thee for all thy blessings as we give unto thee all praise, honour and glory as we wait thy son's return. And we pray to you through his name. Amen. <laughs>